Hey guys, it's Danielle. Welcome back to another Tuesday chat, y'all. So we are in the midst of Vlogtober and today I just was not feeling like vlogging, was not feeling the best, um, just not up for it. But I thought, you know what, I want to try to get myself out of this funk. So maybe I'll do a sit down video. And I wanted to sit down and chat with you guys and share my birth story with Kaysen because I haven't done that yet. I've shared um, just video footage from that day. I've shared a couple of postpartum updates, but I haven't shared with you guys his birth story and all that transpired and all of that good stuff. And so I thought, you know what? Today would be a good day to sit down and maybe do that and share this story with you guys and talk through my feelings. But before we jump into that, if you are new here, hello, hi, welcome. My name is Danielle and I am the non-traditional mommy. And on this channel, we do life, y'all. I <clears throat> share my life through vlogs. I do reviews. We talk about homeschooling. Currently, we're in the middle of Vlogtober, so feel free to go check out some of those videos. Um, and if you feel so inclined to stick around and join my family, hit the subscribe button to the rest of my people, my non-traditional family, my MVPs. I love you guys. You guys have been more than amazing through this time in my life and I so appreciate you guys thank you for being here thank you for hanging in there with me you guys so let's try to um let's try to get through through this video and talk about Kaysen's birth story so for those of you who are unaware I had my 14th baby on August 12th of this year he was born stillborn was not a shock for us we we knew that he wasn't going to survive so we have been preparing for that um i won't go into all that you can check out those previous videos to kind of get caught up on his situation and diagnosis and all of that but he was born y'all see these are the words that come out of my mouth and i'm like do i say born do I say born because he was not alive? So what is that? What is that? Is that born? What, what do we call that? What is the word for that? I delivered him on October or August 12th of this year. He was originally due at the end of September and I was scheduled to be induced Labor Day weekend because if you're not aware, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, it essentially prevents women from ending even a terminal pregnancy early. So we couldn't deliver him until I was 37 weeks pregnant. So my original due date was the end of September, but we were scheduled to be induced on that first Friday of September. One of the things I talked a lot about in my previous videos was my fear of carrying full term. And for some people that may be hard to understand. What are you afraid of? What, what was your fear? And exactly what happened was my fear. I knew I was carrying a baby that was terminal and I knew all of the risk that came with that because this wasn't our first rodeo with this type of experience. Back in 2009, I had another baby that had a terminal diagnosis and we elected to deliver him at six months. And that was after all of the meetings, all of the talks with the doctors and them just telling us everything that could go wrong if I opted to carry full term. And so I already knew what that looked like. And so for me, we didn't want to put myself at risk and we didn't want to go through the emotional turmoil, but we had to, we had to, that, that was our situation. We, there was nothing we could do legally. So we buckled up, strapped ourselves in and prepared 
for the long haul of carrying him to full term. I went to a doctor's appointment the week before the week before August 12th because I was on my two week rotation um, by the time I deliver him. So I went to an appointment routine, you know, did all the routine checks, my blood pressure, all that stuff. And my blood pressure was slightly high at that appointment. And so I've always had normal blood pressures with all of my pregnancies, never had a high blood pressure reading. So it was slightly high at that appointment, but we kind of, you know, thought, well, it's due to traveling, those kind of things. But there was also other things. My amniotic fluid was starting to become low, which meant the baby wasn't swallowing and peeing anymore. He had stopped growing, so he, there was no growth um, from my previous ultrasound because when you are high risk, you get ultrasounds done at every single um, doctor's appointment. Those things coupled with the high blood pressure was basically telling my nurse practitioner that my body was starting to shut down and trying to reject the pregnancy. And so she reached out to the higher ups and told them, you know, what was going on to try to see if we could move my induction date up and it was denied. And so um, she wanted me to come back that next week just to see if there if things were getting worse, because the last thing we wanted was for the baby to die in utero. And that's what it looked like was happening, because with that, you know, other issues can happen. Other things can go wrong. And, and one of the big things was that we didn't necessarily want me to have an unnecessary surgery like a cesarean if I didn't have to. And just so many things. I was so far away from the hospital. And so she was concerned that with all of these things, that that's what was happening. And so she wanted me to come back just to see if things were staying the same or if things were getting worse. And y'all, I said in that vlog that I didn't want to go because I felt like it was a waste of my time. I felt like it didn't matter if things were getting worse. They still were going to reject it. Like doctors are so afraid that they can't. This whole Roe versus Wade thing has taken morality out of health care. It's taken... Um, doctor's ability to really care for their patients out of health care. So my husband was like, no, you're going, you're going. <laughs> we're going to get in this car and we're going to drive to Nashville and you're going to go. That night before I couldn't sleep. Like I just could not sleep. My anxiety was so high. It's tossed and turned. I was up crying. Like I just had this sinking feeling. Um, but just chopped it up to emotions, you know, me being in the situation that I was in. Next day we go, we get to my appointment. They do take my blood pressure and it's high, higher than it was at the previous appointment. Then my ultrasound, things had looked, was getting progressively worse. At this point, she's worried because my blood pressure did not go down. It went up. She was like, I really want you to go get monitored, like be put on a monitor and monitor your blood pressure for the next hour or so. Because again, I travel. So it was like, is this because you traveled? What's going on? So I went to triage hooked me up to a monitor and um, they were asking me like, do you have a headache? Have you had these symptoms? One of the symptoms was like pressure in your chest and I was like I have but you know I thought it was just heartburn because I tend to have really bad heartburn with my pregnancies and I, I was I was <laughs> I was I was I was I was like my headache um I hadn't ate that day I hadn't ate yet but I'm on the monitor they're monitoring my blood pressure and all of a sudden the machine I'm on the monitor for probably about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes or so. And then the machine starts going insane. It's like making this crazy noise. <laughs> my husband's looking at it and my blood pressure was like 160 over 90. 
And so the nurse comes in. She's like, did you do something? I'm like, no, I'm just laying here. So she's like, okay, let's, you know, don't move your arm. Keep your arm straight. Let's just kind of, because it, you know, your blood pressure just spiked up really high. So let's just not move. Let's just kind of be still. And we're going to check it again in 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes. My blood pressure is 170 over 110. She comes in. She's like, nope. Nope, you're not leaving. They give me a shot immediately. And I'm like, what is happening? What's happening? She's like, you're not leaving. Your blood pressure just spiked up. That's, you know, three thing, three signs. We needed to do that three times or something like that. We're going to do blood work to see if it's something else or if it's literally preeclampsia, if that's what it is. Doctor comes in. Um, you know, she's like, based off of what we saw in the ultrasound today, your blood pressure, we've got to deliver this baby today. And now I'm like freaking out, y'all. And, you know, for me, it was like, this is what I was trying to prevent. We had drove up. My boys had a football game the next day. This was on a Friday. That Saturday, they were going to have their very first football game. My kids were home. Jaden was babysitting all the kids because, again, we thought we were going, coming back. We had dinner plans scheduled for that night. Not that all of this mattered, but I'm because had it been, you know, just a regular pregnancy, deliver is delivery, right? But in my mind, I'm thinking I was trying to prevent this. Like, I was trying to prevent the chaos of what is because now my kids are home. We got to figure out how to get them here. Am I okay? Am I going to be okay? You know, like what is happening? What there was so much. And so they immediately take me down to um, delivery. They put me in this room and you can see it on a video. I, I don't know if you can get the full spectrum of it, but it was the off wing is what they called it. And it was like under re under construction like they were redoing that wing and she was like oh all our other rooms are full eventually we're gonna get you over there that didn't happen and you know the nurse I had with delivery was amazing she was amazing and she said to me she was like you know I know this room isn't the best but you're away from everybody else and hearing the babies cry and you know this this may be good for you and she ended up that was true that ended up being right but y'all the room was like something out of like area 54 like an alien zombie movie like when you see hospitals that have been abandoned and they go in looking for supplies that's what this room looked like and so I'm thinking you know with JB Jr I was in this luxurious room it was comfortable it was huge it was like his birth was just despite what was going on it was the most peaceful um experience this experience was just chaos um we're in this room and i'm on this like ambulance size bed, <laughs> literally ambulance, ambulance size bed. And that was the bed I was on for two days. For two days, I was on this ambulance size bed. And so they start the, um, I actually didn't have to get Pitocin. Um, I just had the gel put in on my cervix to loosen my cervix. And so they start that process and they put me on magnesium so I'm on that so I'm hooked up to this getting that done meanwhile and this is August 11th Sydney's birthday is August 12th which again is another reason y'all and so now I'm like I'm gonna deliver this baby on Sydney's birthday and that sucks for her for me for for all of it like it sucked and it could have been, especially when it was something that could have been prevented, you know, had it been a healthy pregnancy, it would have been like, oh, he's going to come on your birthday, you know, kind of like 11. He's August 14th. But this was like her brother that's 
do we say died on her birthday? Do we say died because he wasn't born? What do we say? What do we say? He was alive in my belly. He died on her birthday. It was so much. So Lonnie's on the phone with my sorority sister. Her mother-in-law's in the hospital. She's in ICU. And my husband's on the phone with her and her husband like, can y'all bring our, us our kids? <laughs> And I'm like, you can't ask them. Like, he's dealing with his mom. Like, this is cake. This is chaos. Chaos, y'all. But um, they were like, absolutely. And dropped everything. Found us an Airbnb for the kids. Then all the night, came and got our kids. Drove them all the way to Nashville. Got them situated in the Airbnb. My other friend who lives in Nashville, she was a teacher. So thank God this happened on a Friday because she was off that weekend. So I called her. I'm like, can you stay with the kids at the Airbnb? Make sure they get fed. You know, I don't want them to be alone. Um, Jaden wanted to be at the hospital with me the whole time. And prior to all of this, we had met with the social worker and we had planned out what was supposed to be a similar birth to JB Jr.'s where my kids are going to be there. We we're going to have these projects for them to do. And it was going to be a time for our family to gather and grieve and celebrate and grieve and celebrate as a family. And I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what we had planned out. But of course, you cannot plan against mother nature unless you plan against mother nature, right? So my kids got there and Jaden and Sydney got to the hospital. And so I'm getting this stuff on my cervix and because it's chaos. I mean, when I say chaos, I mean, it was just so much going on. Nobody really knew. Nobody was prepared for me. Whereas with JB Jr., everybody was prepared. They knew I was coming in. They knew this was what was going to happen. And so I had a medical team that I believe was um, versed in, in this type of delivery. My team that I had this time didn't appear to be versed in this. My nurse though, my deliver my nurse that was with me during delivery, amazing. Amazing. God gave me the perfect nurse for that time. And so, you know, she's trying to make me as comfortable as possible. She's trying to do everything that she can within her power and knowledge. My contractions kicked in. I didn't want to be sleepy and like, you know, drowsy. But I did. It, it's weird. So with JB Jr., I, I got the um, my pain medicine right away and just kind of slept until it was time to deliver him. With this situation, it was different because my blood pressure was high. And so there was that worry of that. And what do we, you know, medication and all of these different things. And so I ended up doing the laughing gas or whatever originally. Let me tell you something. That stuff does nothing, nothing. So just skip that whole part. Just skip that part. And because this was an induced labor, I was not prepared for the pain of an induced labor. I forgot what that pain was like because my births are normally at home and natural. It was not only the pain of an induced labor, but the chaos, the stress of my preeclampsia, um, the uncomfortableness of the room. And it all just happened so fast. And before I knew it, I was in so much pain, so much pain. They gave me a shot of opioid. I don't know, y'all. What is it? What is the one um, that instantly just knocked me out? I couldn't think I was it, w it was crazy. And then they were like, do you want the epidural? Because the pain was so bad. It was so bad. JB Jr. I didn't have an epidural. There was no need. Um, it was just a slow, natural process. This process felt chaotic and rushed. I can't think of any other words. And so they're like, do you want an epidural? And I'm thinking, I don't know. 
Like, I feel like I have to push. I know my body, right? I've done this <laughs> numerous of times. And so I'm trying to convey to the doctor while crying, bawling tears of what I'm feeling and what I'm wanting and what I'm needing. But at the same time, it's chaos happening in the room. And my nurse, she's like, rubbing me because I'm crying and I'm thinking and I'm just saying why am I doing this to myself why am I feeling this kind of pain and this baby is not going to survive and the nurse is rubbing me and she's like it's okay you're strong you're not weak you're not weak you're strong you're strong and I'm just like I'm so stupid like I'm I'm, I'm just saying these things to myself because I'm thinking I knew better I should have got the pain medication up front I knew better right but it was it was just my brain it was so much um so I'm like yes give me the epidural the midst of the epidural team coming in I feel the need to push and I'm telling them, I feel like I got to push. I feel like I got to push. I feel like I got to push. And I just couldn't help it. I just bared down. And when I say it's not funny, but it's funny. My water broke and it just because I'm on this bed. My legs are open and it just there was one male nurse in the room and it got all over him, just drenched, drenched him, drenched his clothes. I know he was pissed. I know he was pissed. And everybody's were like, <gasps> and then they're like, the baby is here. No epidural. I, I hope they didn't charge my insurance company for that. And so they left and I'm like apologizing. The whole time, y'all, let me say this, because there's also this fear as a black woman where I'm, I'm worried about my care, you know, like there's, that's in the back of my head, but somehow I'm, I'm concerned about my care. I'm delivering a baby that's not going to survive. And I'm apologizing the whole time during all this. I'm literally apologizing to these doctors and to these nurses for being in the predicament that I'm in. Like, how crazy is that, right? And my nurse, I can't say it enough how amazing she was. She's just like, girl, you don't have to apologize. You don't have to apologize. Like, she's talking in my ear. She's consoling me, and I'm just bawling my eyes out to her. And she's like, it is, Tanya, it is okay. Like, you don't owe us any apology. You are okay. And so, so I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. And I need to say these things. This is, this is all out of order. This is all out of order. Let me get a little light in here, y'all. This story is all out of order. Um, I need to say this too. While I'm preparing, like they're doing the cervical gels, doctor comes in and is like, have you thought about birth control for when you leave? And I'm looking, I'm like, <laughs> did you not read my chart did you not read my chart that I'm about to deliver a baby that's not going to survive and these are this is a teaching school this is a teaching hospital and so these are all resident doctors coming in and so they are just literally checking off the box yes I asked the patient that you know, like literally checking off the boxes, which it was also a resident doctor that delivered. The main doctor was in there, but she had the resident doctor delivering my baby. Just just let that. And I'm thinking this is how women die. This is how um, I'm not a test subject. Now, when I delivered JB Jr., there was resident doctors that came in. But every time my main doctor would come in and I didn't have a main doctor at, at Vanderbilt because, again, this was all just kind of thrown together. But they would come in and they would say, hey, is it OK if this resident doctor come in and talk to you, you know, or whatever and get my consent? This one, they were just coming in. 
like I was um, a zoo animal. And so, yeah, so, so that happened. And so in the, in the midst of me pushing, 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 there's a residence doctor delivering, there's the, I guess, head doctor, teaching doctor, whatever she was. And I'm loopy. I'm like half drugged, you know, seeing double vision, crying, apologizing. And I'm pushing, pushing, pushing. And I'm like, why is he not coming out? And I'm like crying. Like, why is he not coming out? What is wrong? I can't push anymore. Like, there's nothing left. What is happening? And they're not saying anything. And it's like quiet in the room. And the doctor's like looking at me. And the resident doctor's asking her questions. And they're like, and I'm just like, what is happening? Y'all, I've delivered how many babies? And I'm like, what is happening? And finally, she says, your baby's breech. He's coming out butt first. And so we're having to like, you know, I guess navigate this. And so somehow amidst all of this, he turned. Um, <laughs> and so finally they get him out. And when I say there was nothing, there was nothing they wrap him up they give him to me and everybody just leaves room is a trashed I know room is trashed y'all because all of this chaos ensued before I'm just there everybody just leaves and I'm just holding my dead baby and I'm bawling and I'm crying and our nurse is trying to gather her thoughts. <sighs> that is how I delivered him. Doctor came back to ask me about birth control. <laughs> and I'm holding my dead baby and I'm like, you know, she said, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, have you thought about what's the word they use? What is it? What is it, y'all? Somebody help me. Somebody help me. I'm drawing a blank. But have you thought about birth control, contra contraception? Have you thought about contraception um, once you go home? No, I haven't. I'm trying to wrap my brain. Like, I'm still bloody. Um, my nurse, who was amazing, got off. Uh, shift was over. Another nurse came in who was amazing also. God gave me the nurses that I needed at the perfect time. Um, because she came in and she loved on Kaysen. She loved on Kaysen because what I say they just gave him and I'm just holding him and he's just wrapped in this cloth and there's nothing. And I'm like, what now? What not? Like JB Jr. It was like they, they wrapped him. They cleaned him. They gave him to me. They asked me, you know, take all the time you need. They came back. They checked up. That was, there was none of that, y'all. This nurse came in and she immediately tended to him. She took him, she cleaned him, she bathed him, she put him in this cute little outfit. Um, she made arrangements for our photos to still happen. She brought art stuff for my kids that we had talked about doing. She got his handprints, um, footprints. She made molds of his feet and hands. She loved on him and she would bring him to me when I was ready for him. She would take him out and she did it in a way as though he was a living baby. There was so much care, so much respect. I'm just so grateful for her. So grateful for her. So, so her shift was over 
and we kept him for two days. We kept him the day he was born. We kept him the next day. And then at that, that next morning, we finally um, gave him to the hospital, um, said our goodbyes, which was the hardest thing. Did I say that I was still in this room, still in this bed, still in the same gown this whole time? We're on day three, well, day two and a half, you could say. It's August, it's the night of, and this whole time, he was born at like four in the morning. And um, this whole time, I'm just kind of in this room, in this bed, in this thing, still getting magnesium. And the night nurse comes in. And the whole nurse experience went downhill. I say every day, thank you, guys. She was not my nurse during delivery. Thank you, guys. She was not my nurse after I delivered because it was the worst experience. She clearly was uncomfortable with the fact that we still had him in the room. And I'm not taking away from that because everybody can't handle that kind of scenario. But I feel like as a nurse, you should be trained on that, especially labor and delivery. And now with Roe versus Wade being overturned, y'all about to see this. This is about to be a thing. And so it was clear she was not comfortable. So because she wasn't comfortable, we had him in the room. She couldn't care for me because every time she would come in the room, she would start singing hymns <laughs> and praying and I'm not making this up, y'all. And she would just kind of like, and he was next to my bed. And so she would, you know, fumble and couldn't check my blood pressure for real. Couldn't check my medicine. Like she just was so uncomfortable. There was a couple times my machine was beeping and Lonnie had to go find her. And then she would come in and kind of like, oh, you know, not want to look. Thank God. Somehow she arranged to have me moved to another section of the floor, finally got into a nicer bed, finally got into a nicer room, bigger room, and we were all able to finally sleep because there was no sleeping in that other room. There was no, there was nothing. And this nurse was finally like, do you want to get cleaned up? Do you want a new gown? Do you, you know, let's get your pads, get you some new panties. Like, let's get you freshened up. And she, too, was not freaked out about the baby, which is why she was able to do that, you know. Um, and she was the one we sent him with because y'all would have never sent my baby with that other nurse. Um, you know, with her, I couldn't find his molds that Shelby made. And she was like, I'm going to find them. I'm going to find him, find them. And she put like a little box together with all of his stuff and his hats and his little gown that he wore. Um, and so she was just perfect for, for both of us, just perfect. And, um, finally they took me off the magnesium. And once you come off the magnesium, you have to stay in the hospital for another 24 hours to make sure your blood pressure doesn't skyrocket back up. And so doctor comes in again. Have you thought about contraception? And I'm just like, has nobody read my chart? Has nobody said we already asked this question? And I think I'm irritated by that, y'all. Not because I'm anti-contraception. I kind of am now. I mean, I've been on birth control in my life before. It's not that I've... Let's get some more light. Sun is going behind the trees. It's not that I have never been on birth control. I have. But I had an OBGYN... Um, that when I went to get my birth control, he sat me down and he gave me the most comprehensive, detailed information about birth control than any other doctor I've ever had before. And I think it goes back to black women and their care. You know, I was a teenage mom, so that made me a statistic and that that changed the trajectory of my care I feel like for a very long time until I got to him and he was the first doctor that literally just sat me down and explained everything to me and told me that it was okay 
that I, if I chose not to be on birth control, <laughs> you know, the first doctor that essentially gave me permission, not that I needed it, but I kind of did. I mean, I was in my twenties. Um, and I still felt this enormous amount of guilt about having babies, even though I was married by this time. So he was the first doctor that just took that time to like talk, to, you know, to, to educate me and then to free me to say, you know, it's okay <laughs> if you choose not to do this. Um, and so it's not that I'm against it. However, one of the things I've realized that has made Kaysen's delivery and situation so different from JB Jr.'s, because I've struggled with that. Why are you grieving so hard with Kaysen? Why is this one hitting you, you know, in the pit? Um, there's been guilt around the fact that I didn't grieve quite as long with JB Jr. And I think what I've realized is because with JB Jr. I was younger, not a whole lot younger, but I was 29. And for me, it was like, deliver. We're going to try again. We're going to try again. We're going to get our boy. And we did. We got major. And so there wasn't this overwhelming feeling of that's how the story ends. And that's what I felt with Kaysen. I felt like that's how the story ends. But then there's also this part of me that's like, well, it don't have, you know, does it have to end this way? Yes, because I'm like, I'm older and now I have this whole preeclampsia and uh, a fear and menopause is right around the corner. Like there's all these things, but then there's all these like, but girl, you're still healthy. You're okay. You know, and so contraception for me and, and also my feelings now on where I stand with not wanting to be on birth control and why I haven't went back on is for my own personal convictions and reasons. And so, you know, for us, it would be a vasectomy for him. That would be our contraception, which is permanent. And I mean, in a way, it's like, well, we're done, right? So it's okay. But then it's like, y'all, I just have so many like hangups. And so for me, I'm like, I can't think about that. Like we need to go home and we need to talk and we need to figure out what's our next. Like, what are we doing? What, where do we go from here? Is this how the story ends? Do we have this unshakable faith and just see what happens? Or do we, do we close this chapter forever? Like, we need to talk about that as a couple. That's how I felt. And there was like this no like um, compassion around that. For those of you who have had babies, I don't know if this makes sense, but it's already hard enough when you just had a baby and they're asking these questions. But to be holding your dead baby and they're asking these questions is a whole different thing. Like, that whole experience is why I stopped having my babies in the hospital in the first place. <sighs> so anyway, um, I finally get moved to a regular postpartum room um, just for monitoring. They take me off of all of, you know, the machines and everything. And we're without casing for the first time. And me and Lonnie, the kids are not with us. We sent them back to the Airbnb. And it was our first time, just me and him, trying to process everything that happened. Y'all let me know if y'all want me to do a video with him talking about his process and emotions. Because one of the things he said is, I was so worried that, you know, I, was, I knew I was losing my son. But then all I could think is I'm going to lose my wife too. And there was so much chaos that I couldn't say he was wrong <laughs> because there was so much chaos uh, in his feelings. Like, hey, you know, why'd you think that? We were at a hospital. It was okay. I, no, I couldn't give him that, that type of feedback because of our experience. Only time a doctor came into my room, y'all, I kid you not, was to ask me about contraception. That's the only time. Maybe that's the way it is now in hospitals. I don't know. 
But I thought that was weird. I'm like, is somebody going to come in and like tell me about my blood work? Tell me like how to manage when I get home? There wasn't that. Um, there wasn't that. I had a social worker come in and you could tell she didn't really know <laughs> what to do or say. Um, like, I feel like the whole medical field needs to be revamped. If if Roe versus Wade being overturned, it's going to be long lasting. Uh, first of all, you don't need a social worker. You need a therapist. No no shade to a social worker. No shade to y'all at all. Because what y'all do is is difficult as well. But it, I personally feel as a therapist that what we do is different. What we handle is different. That's just my feelings. Again, no shade. I'm not, I'm not knocking what social workers do. But I do feel like there are different navigations of a walk that a therapist can navigate through with somebody um, in that moment. And so saw her and, you know, we had to ask. In fact, my my soror, when she was there, was like, oh, she's getting a uh, blood pressure machine when she leaves. Y'all going to give her a blood pressure machine. Make sure that happens. She set that in motion to make sure that happens because I didn't know like, oh, I need to monitor my blood pressure when I get home for a certain amount of time. And so she was that advocate for that. Nurse came in, gave me the blood pressure machine, no instructions on how to use it. <laughs> Because by this time I had a whole different nurse and they kind of were like, oh, she going home. So won't even need to go in there. The only person that came in there was the person that checked my blood pressure every hour. And that was it. Gave me my blood pressure machine, my ibuprofen and was like, I'll see you in a week to get your blood pressure checked again. Um, and that was it. We walked out of the hospital, not only with Casey's belongings, but also like, what just happened? What just happened? We had a baby. <laughs> what just happened? That's how we walked away from that experience. And um, um, and I am still trying to process what happened, I think. I'm still trying to process it. And there's days where it just hits me so much harder than other days. You know, I went to put on a pair of jeans. And I'll probably talk about this more in my update, like how I've been feeling eight weeks in. Um, but I went to put on a pair of jeans. And I put them on and I couldn't button them and I my first thought was like dang I can't like these jeans too small and then it was you had a baby oh that's right I had a baby it's, it's moments like that right where it's crazy because my body just went back to like normal besides my blood pressure which I think knock on somebody's wood has finally regulated itself um but yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, that did happen. You had a baby. <laughs> That's why you can't fit these jeans. Um, so, yeah. That's Kaysen's birth story. <sighs> if you guys have any questions or want to know anything else, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I know it was kind of all over the place, but. Yeah, today I just, I wasn't feeling it, wasn't feeling vlogging. And um, I thought, you know what, now's the time to share his story, his birth story. And so here we are. Thank y'all for being here, um, being a part of this journey. If you want to come along for the rest of the ride, feel free to join the family and, and, and come along. To the rest of y'all, I love you guys, and I will see y'all tomorrow.